so, so we have now some, um, I think, 13 minutes to, to speak about your, your vision about how open source can, can be implemented in your own company organization uh, within an open, open innovation strategy. All right, so I, I will let you introduce yourself and present how, w w what is your, your perspective and how open source can, can be better with, uh, open, your innovation can be better with open source and open data and all this stuff. So, please. Oui, bonjour. Euh, donc, je m'appelle Laurent Lemeur, je suis CTO d'un nouveau laboratoire qui s'appelle... Uh, let's speak English, rather. Yes, uh, well, I'm a CTO of a new lab uh, called EDL Lab, which has been created to, um, to uh, push the adoption of uh, EPUB, uh, format, a free format uh, for digital publications in the global digital uh, industry. Hello, my name is Javier Serrano, and I lead a team of uh, engineers, software and hardware developers at CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, and uh, I'm the initiator of the Open Hardware Initiative at CERN, so trying to apply the principles of open source, free and open source software in the hardware realm. Hello, uh, my name is Thierry Carrez, I'm the Director of Engineering for the OpenStack Foundation. So we're uh, behind the, the OpenStack project and trying to make sure that it, this open innovation playground goes somewhere. Um, I'll present more after. Okay. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to say some quick words about CERN first. Uh, so CERN is a, an international organization whose mandate is to conduct a fundamental research in the field of particle physics. Uh, so it's about studying the fundamental constituents of matter and also uh, their interactions. So what the world is made of and how it works. Uh, most of the research is conducted in the Large Hadron Collider, which is um, the biggest particle accelerator in the world, uh, 27 kilometers in cir circumference. It's buried 150 meters underground. Uh, in the border between France and Switzerland. So you can see it here. Um, it, um, part of it is uh, in the nice countryside in the Pays de Gex area in France, and uh, another part in the canton of Geneva in, in Switzerland. And if you go in the tunnel, uh, what you see is uh, what you have here in the lower right part of the slide. Um, it's a sequence of superconducting magnets that provide magnetic fields of very high power, uh, very high magnetic fields to contain, to constrain the particles to stay within the circumference. And in order to do that, uh, we need to have superconducting magnets. Uh, that means cooling them down to 2 Kelvin, which is minus 271 degrees Celsius. The vacuum that we need in the beam pipe is also extreme. We don't want the particles to collide uh, with uh, spurious collisions with gas molecules uh, so as not to perturb the beam. So it's uh, 10 times less pressure than at the surface of the moon. And, uh, and then there is these two counter-rotating beams uh, uh, which are ma made to cross each other and to collide in four different places in the accelerator. And around those places, physicists have built these huge detectors, which are the size of cathedrals, and every uh, one, uh, at, at a rate of 40 million times per second, there are these collisions, and in the collisions, there is a non-zero probability that particles are annihilated and other particles are created, and by statistically uh, studying uh, the data gathered from these experiments, physicists can challenge established theories or can confirm them. Um, CERN is also, of course, a, an international collaboration with 21 member states. And uh, as you can see, there is quite a lot of technical challenge, cha challenges that we have to cope with. Uh, so innovation is really uh, at the core of our everyday work. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, so these are these fine fellows are meeting in a in a meeting room in Paris here in 1953. It's one of the first meetings 
of the uh, CERN Council, and they are drafting the CERN Convention, which is our founding document. And um, you really have to consider the context to appreciate what they achieved. Many of these people were in countries that were war enemies a few years earlier, and uh, they came up with a remarkable document uh, that even today, when you read it, is very visionary. It looks very modern uh, to me. Uh, it contains things like the results of experimental and theoretical work shall be published or otherwise made generally available. Uh, there is further down the document also a uh, reference to fostering international collaboration and dissemination of information. Uh, and I, I really like this picture because it illustrates that you can have very productive meetings without laptops. So uh, the question is, how do we interpret that mandate in the 21st century? So we have all these uh, technological challenges to cope with at CERN. And we are asked also, and this is a core part of our mandate, to maximize our impact on society. So how do we deal with it? Um, of course, uh, open source, uh, CERN is not special in appreciating the value of open source uh, to convey what we do and to maximize our impact on society. But we do have a privileged vantage point in the sense that we come from a tradition of the tradition of scientific research. Uh, and it's very natural to us, this notion of innovation, in happen, innovation happening as a result of adding incremental improvements to what exists. This is why Newton said that he had seen very far away because he was standing in the, on the shoulder of giants. Uh, and he himself provided a basis, along with many others like Maxwell, uh, on which Einstein built. And Einstein would have been very surprised if there, ha there had been any kind of economic or legal uh, hurdle uh, to access this freely available information that he built upon. So, um, Innovation is, is by definition uh, unexpected. You cannot really foresee when it will happen. But you can put chances on your side uh, by publishing your stuff in a way that it's easily understandable by other people and hoping for the best. And that takes different shapes depending on the field of endeavor. For example, our colleagues, uh, you know, we, we need a lot of computing at CERN and we are users and contributors to OpenStack. Uh, then our uh, open data colleagues, they provide uh, infrastructure in the form of open source software uh, uh, to people who want to upload, people at CERN and outside CERN who want to upload data, metadata, explanations, uh, articles, so that others can reproduce the results of their experiments. And because it's open source, the unexpected happens. So some people, for example, use those huge files of data to teach statistics with absolutely no concern with um, high energy physics. Other people use those huge files with nice structures to test big data algorithms, and so on and so forth. Now at CERN, we also do uh, quite a lot of electronics that could be useful elsewhere. And this is the part I'm uh, most concerned with, uh, mo most involved in. Um, we electronics designers are very jealous of our uh, software development friends. Um, when you're a software developer, you upload something to the web and then you don't ask yourself if somebody is going to be able to open uh, the file, read it, modify it, republish, do something useful like compile it. Uh, so we would like to take uh, the community of hardware designers in that direction to so make it as easy to share for them as it is for our software colleagues. And we have done a number of things. We have created the open hardware repository. Uh, we have uh, come up with the CERN open hardware license, which aims at being something roughly like the GPL for hardware. Uh, we have worked with companies to find business models whereby they can uh, make a living make, uh, making and selling open hardware. And now we're tackling what we believe is the last big hurdle to sharing hardware, which is contributing to free and open source software uh, tools to design electronics. Uh, and then there is, of course, our open access friends at CERN. Uh, they have also innovated enormously by, you know, open access, as, as you know, it's this notion of um, um, 
taking the, uh, the, uh, the taking articles and uh, turning the market upside down in a way that the uh, payment for the processing charges of the articles does not fall on the readers. The readers can free freely access the content, and the payment is done elsewhere. So our colleagues in uh, in the CERN Open Access team have uh, pooled resources with many other teams uh, uh, outside of CERN and uh, conducted. Uh, a call for tender, a competitive call for tender, so that publishers bid for publishing the articles. Uh, the money comes from funding agencies and from uh, libraries and other entities. And at the end, the reading is, is for free for uh, all, the, all the readers, and physicists don't see uh, a change. And of course, all these nice things happening at CERN and elsewhere are happening also uh, enabled by the fact that we're, that we're all connected thanks to the web, which is itself another innovation from CERN. Here you can see the uh, famous memo of Tim Berners-Lee with the annotation from his supervisor, vague but exciting at the time. Uh, and this illustrates that um, open source and innovation breeds more open source and more innovation. Thank you. Well, this quote is uh, from uh, George Kasher, is the uh, lead of DAISY. DAISY is a company, a uh, standards organization dedicated to accessibility. And uh, he sent it uh, yesterday uh, in an article to support uh, France. So I wanted to speak about that because today I will speak about tools for the free dissemination of uh, digital publications, what we call usually e-books. At the beginning, uh, there was um, EPUB3. Uh, trees of, uh, EPUB3 is a format for born digital publications. Uh, so novels, uh, uh, educational publications, legal publication, everything. So it's created by a standards organization called IDPF. And uh, the third version of EPUB has been uh, released in uh, 2011. So here you've got the list of... Um, EPUB uh, objectives. It's built on the web technologies, HTML5, SVG, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's uh, more, it's dedicated to e-readers, so readers of e-books. Uh, if you think about uh, the web and HTML5 uh, as uh, water, I would call EPUB an ice cube. It contains some part of the web in a zip format, in a package format. So EPUB3 is uh, in search of inter interoperability, accessibility, and uh, flexibility of use. Some re reality check. So EPUB is used in the industry, but um, not as much as we would like, because some big players uh, in the world, Amazon, Apple, Adobe, uh, well, they play um, uh, my castle, my rules, uh, play. Uh, so Amazon, for example, has uh, more than 60% of the U.S. market in uh, digital publications and uh, uh, uses some vendor lock-in with uh, their Kindle and their, their uh, well, wall garden system. Apple does the more or less the same, even if it's uh, using uh, EPUB as a format. And uh, Adobe is a bit different because Adobe uh, gives an SDK, a software SDK, to uh, people wanting to implement ebooks, but uh, at a price, it's closed, and uh, it contains, uh, it offers a DRM that is uh, far from being uh, easy to use. So first problem, some vendor lock-in. Second problem in the reality, some fragmentation of the market. Many small companies try to uh, create authoring systems, reading systems, and, uh, well, they don't have a piece of uh, software that allows them to do it quickly. So lack of interoperability, lack of accessibility. If you are a blind people today, it's uh, very expensive to, to buy the, the system to read digital books uh, for, for you. Lack of flexibility and, well, lack of usability often. Uh, EDR Lab. So what is uh, this uh, laboratory that is uh, brand new? Uh, Idea Lab, well, had many fairies uh, going, uh, venting uh, to the cradle. The first one is IDPF, the creator of, of uh, EPUB. 
Uh, I will speak quickly also about uh, W3C and DAISY, but the second big one is Radium at the top of the screen. Radium is a foundation, a US foundation that was created to implement EPUB, to create open source software around uh, EPUB because EPUB is a complex uh, structure, very flexible, very powerful, but complex. So the idea of Radium is to create a, an open source stack an SDK that will uh, pass EPUB files and allow people to create readers from it. Radium is a US foundation and uh, many uh, members of Radium are European and French. So at uh, one time, uh, the Radium people said, okay, we need some, uh, some uh, well, bridge with Europe. And uh, they, they asked, where could we put it? Uh, on the right, you will see uh, that other people came into the loop. So these are the editors, the French editors, Hachette, Editis, uh, Madrigal, this is Gallimard and Flammarion, Media Participation, this is Ma um, Dargo, for example. So the, the four biggest editors in French uh, decided to, well, collaborate. So uh, this is innovation in France, the big, big players. Uh, well, they forget their, that they are competitors and they, they decide to collaborate to create a small, well, association, because we are an association, a small association in France uh, to support Radium uh, softwares. So they gather with the SNE, this is the Syndicat National de l'Edition, with uh, uh, the Ministries of Culture, Ministries of Finance. Uh, they gather with Cap Digital, with small, um, well, uh, commercial players in France, technical uh, uh, vendors like uh, Feedbooks, Montano, and so we begin to build something that is between the editors, between the French tech, and uh, between Europe and, uh, and the US. Uh, DAISY comes into the play because they want more accessibility inside the, their, uh, well, the, the implementation of uh, EPUB, and W3C comes to the play because they want later, it's a future, it's an objective, to have, uh, well, the web and the digital publications uh, be uh, totally, well, uh, symmetrical. They, they would like really this, that this idea of water that becomes an ice cube to be transported in a pocket uh, gets uh, real. So to, f to finish, what is uh, the way we see innovation at uh, EDR Lab? Uh, innovation for me is a new answer to an old uh, problem. So, for us, uh, innovation comes to the loop because, well, first, organizationally, uh, we uh, are a sort of commando of uh, developers. Uh, we will be five soon uh, to develop and help the US Foundation Radium to develop an open source that is called Radium SDK, uh, made of JavaScript, made of C++, uh, totally portable between uh, Android, iOS, Mac, PCs. Uh, so using web technologies, uh, trying to uh, use the latest technologies uh, as uh, much as possible. For example, uh, maybe we will use, uh, we are new using Node.js at the moment, we will use Angular, we will use Electron, Cordova, Ionic, all these names that are uh, useful uh, open source, uh, well, bricks for the moment. We are non-profit, so everything is, uh, well, copyleft or with a very special alternative uh, uh, commercial uh, license. Uh, and we try to be a dedicated agile team uh, working with the people, uh, the open source people in the US. We hope by this to uh, make the EPUB dreams uh, uh, reality, interoperability, accessibility, flexibility, and, and usability. Thanks. So, open source is one. I want to make a follow-up to what Alison said. Alison said that open source uh, went beyond, beyond proprietary software. I think Open source today is the natural choice for users. It's also the preferred model for developers. So the question is now, what's the next battlefield? What's the next fight? What, where, what's the next frontier for us? Um, 
Sam Ramji, who is the CEO of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, said that single vendor open source is the new proprietary. What he meant by that is uh, that if a given open source project is completely under the control of a single entity, which decides what goes in and what does not go in, then it's not significantly different from proprietary software. I tend to agree with him, but for slightly different reasons. I think single vendor open source is missing a critical opportunity. We live in a world that is fast reaching its limits, environmental limits, obviously, but also economical limits. And we need to invent new ways of producing, ways that generate a lot less waste. Open source software is not just about building better technical solutions. It also has the potential to reduce waste due to useless duplication of effort, reduce waste due to non-interoperable solutions, and reduce waste due to uh, preventing everyone from participating in innovation. Single vendor open source is still very much about creating parallel private playgrounds, so it does not really help in reducing that waste. You need to go beyond open source, you need to do open design, open development, open community, set up neutral collaboration spaces, level playing grounds with uh, governance that is representative to the contributors of the project. We rely on independent foundations to set up this environment where we do those neutral collaboration spaces. They do that by providing an asset lock uh, and, and ensuring independent and representative governance. But foundations also have a secondary, a more lucrative role, which is to cultivate downstream. That's about providing a common marketing and business development engine for the sponsor members, uh, organizing events, or controlling the, the usage of the trademark. And some foundations, I plead guilty, uh, were so successful at cultivating downstream that creating new foundations became a very popular exercise. The issue with that is uh, some of them are just trade associations, and they lost sight of this primary mission, which is to protect the open source project. So for example, you would have a, a foundation that will uh, give control of our technical matters to uh, a, people appointed by their main sponsors, be becoming effectively a pay-to-play uh, environment. So I'll end with this short intervention with a plea. Uh, whenever you are presented with a new foundation, look under the hood. Check if the technical open source project, the upstream open source project, is really independent from the sponsor members. Check if contribution is really the only currency that is valid uh, on the upstream open source project. Because all foundations are not created equal, and a foundation is not a guarantee for real open innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have five minutes left to uh, maybe to exchange about how, how all your discussion, your talks. What, uh, I'm glad you, you, you speak about um, uh, mutualization, about interoper interoperability. Um, and foundation. I think it's really important to um, to speak about um, b both open source and interoperability. To uh, how how does it work together? Is it is every uh, open source solution interoperable or, or not? Or is is it compatible? Yes, of course. Or it's really interesting to to focus sometimes on interoperability. Um, um, it's easier to, to, to ask sector public sometimes to promote interoperability than to promote open source and by promoting interoperability they're helping open source solutions, I think so, uh, to, uh, to, to gain in, and to be more used. How, do, do you want to, to react to what other of the rentable said? 
Yeah, I think, uh, as you said, in the public sector, for me, it is a no-brainer for many reasons. And I think what we're missing in the open source world, in the free and open source world, is, uh, is a better paradigm for the private sector. Um, if, if we saw the numbers in terms of how many people in the private sector use open source solutions, and those are very big numbers. And then if you compare them with the amount of economy uh, uh, driven by open source solutions and, and the, the amount of money b getting into open source solutions and the amount of money going into proprietary solutions, those percentages don't match, which means that we, we have succeeded very well in uh, developing technical solutions and we have succeeded a bit less well in making sure there's an economic paradigm uh, to make it self-sustainable, especially in the private sector. Uh, so, um, I, I, I don't know what the solution is to this, but I welcome very much initiatives like the one in France with legislation and with um, uh, licensing efforts and other types of efforts and, and people being very creative, for example, people with um, a background in economics and trying to find new business models and such. But I, I think there is this mismatch between you know how much it is used and how much economy it uh, generates. And this mismatch is important because when I work when I go to the bakery in my neighborhood, the, I want to buy a baguette, and they ask me for euros, right? They, they are not into this, you know, uh, freedom thingy and so on. I mean, there's a mismatch uh, that we, I think we need to address. Yeah, I think, I think that's very true. I, I've often described that as the, the blind spot. There's a, there's a blind spot in free software and open source that, um, yes, it's freely available and free to use, but in much the same way that if you cut down all the trees without replanting them, eventually there will be no trees left. If you just take and take and take and take and you're not actually feeding back into the ecosystem, then you are in fact damaging the long-term sustainability. Um, I do think more and more companies are beginning to get that idea. And one of the things I've been encouraged to see in projects like OpenStack is that there has been a very strong investment by all of those companies that are using it in developing it. It, it's, it seems like it's almost more the older projects that, that like people are open SSL, they're so used to having it around that they don't even see it. Uh, you know, or didn't until very recently. It just, it was, they were completely blind to it. It was like the wallpaper or something. Um, so I think raising the visibility of the more mature projects is really important to kind of bring them into that forefront where, where companies are actively contributing. To, to come back on the question of interoperability, I think it's also about companies learning the value of interoperability versus the value of differentiation. And, and you know, in the five years of OpenStack, we went from, from people trying to, to be more, to single out their solutions, to, be, to have a, a differentiation factor, to learning the value of actually being interoperable between, between the various implementations. So it takes some time to learn that, but uh, once you get the value of being totally interoperable, it's an easier sell because there is a value to it. Uh, in a world, uh, the, the publication sector, interoperability means, two, in fact, two things. One is the, the technical uh, portability of, uh, of some software. It's very hard today uh, to, to get something that works uh, as much on an iOS, Android, uh, Mac, and PC platform. So interoperability, in fact, the, the portability uh, in this case is, is still hard. Interoperability in case of business model is also hard at the, at the moment. You've got uh, people, vendors, uh, editors who want to, uh, to sell books, uh, for example, Fnac on one side, Cultura, and, uh, and all the others, and they don't really want uh, what they have uh, sold uh, to be used in another silo. So, so for them, it's very hard to, to, to let the door open. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this discussion. I, I think we, we just have to end this roundtable. So um, please thank the um, speakers.